It is three o'clock here on the East Coast. Uh, happy Thursday afternoon. So I thought we'd get started. Uh, we are at the almost at the end of the final day here at Honda Mule Community Days. This is our final presentation, and uh, it seems fitting that we're back up in Canada. Uh, the 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 presentations have been nothing but inspiring for me. Uh, they will be uploaded uh, onto the platform. Give it 24 hours. Um, I'm Kevin Graham. I'm the sales manager for Honda Mula here for the eastern part of the United States and also Canada. I'm very fortunate to be working with my Canada colleagues. I'm based in the metro New York City area. And as I said, we're back in Canada again. Will Prentice joins us this afternoon. Now, he is the brand specialist at Amplis Photo and a significant contributing writer to Photo News and a big Honda Mula fan, I should say that. He is based in Markham, Ontario, which is northeast of Toronto, my daughter's hometown, in fact. Uh, the interesting thing about Will, he is a true Renaissance man, and I mean this sincerely. He knows a lot of things about a lot of things. He really does. And he always makes it look easy. Uh, Will will talk ab about how to get the best prints from your files. While seemingly a complicated task, he'll boil it down for us muggles. That's the short version. Uh, it will be action-packed, I guarantee you. Drop your questions in the Q&A folder. Will, always great to see you, please. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, next time we'll do this in person. we got to get you back we up. Will. You better plan on it. You oh, yeah. Plan. All right, so I am going to share my screen here. Oh, no, you have to allow me to share my screen, Kevin. I will take care of that. We didn't do that in advance. My apologies, all panelists. All panelists, you should be golden now, my friend. Perfect. Yes, thank you. And, whoops. All right. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? You are golden. Perfect. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. All right. So I'm going to make a less than interesting topic, uh, sound a little more interesting. Uh, one of my roles at Amplis is I get a lot of customer service questions. So if you ask a question beyond what's in stock, chances are you're gonna reach me. Um, we distribute over 30 brands. Hanamula is one of our key brands and people ask me a lot of questions about the content we're gonna cover today. So I'm glad it's being recorded so I can just refer people. Uh, back to this video. So we're going to talk about and demystify ICC profiles and also soft proofing, which um, it seems like a bit of alchemy to a lot of people who don't understand. But by the time that we're through this, um, I think it's going to make a lot more sense to everybody. Uh, this is geared more towards people new to print and not so much to the advanced um, printers. But you know, there's always, as I've always learned, there's something for everybody in every presentation. And uh, I'm going to jump in here, but feel free to type your questions in the chat and we will get to those at the end. And as Kevin said, he's monitoring those. So quick agenda for today. So we're, I'm going to fill you in on what an ICC profile is because not everybody knows. Um, I'll quickly show you how to install because it really is quick. Um, Hanamula ICC profiles discuss how paper types and IC profile, ICC profiles work together, uh, discuss some of the process calibration and how you can get the best results out of your images. And then we'll get into soft proofing and print settings in your major software. Uh, then I've got some tips and tricks, which will save you some time and some grief. And uh, as mentioned, we'll jump into the questions. So let's get into this. So what is an ICC profile? Well. In geek speak, it's a set of instructions telling your printer how to apply ink to a certain paper. So that's why there's different ICC profiles for different printers as well as different papers. So one size does not fit all. Um, if you've looked at different papers, uh, you know, William Turner, one of my favorites from Hanamula is a heavier paper. The ink's going to soak in a little differently than it will in one of my other favorites, which is Photo Rag Metallic. Um, and then also the base tint of those cut papers is different. So the ICC profile tells your software how to handle the ink on those specific papers. Uh, now, ICC profiles should be created by the paper companies, not the printer manufacturers. Although, you know, we know Canon and Epson have their own profiles, but that's created for their papers. 
And then Hanamiel, of course, creates the best profiles for the best papers, which um, ensures that your printer is going to give you the best images possible uh, using the uh, ICC profile from Hanamiel on your printers. So the profile, it looks at everything. It's not just about the papers I mentioned. It looks at the type of inks you're using. Um, it looks at that paper. It looks at the, the color tone of the paper, the, the texture, the ability of that paper to, to absorb ink. So it maximizes your ink and colors for each print. Now, one thing I've got to say, usually I save this for the tips and tricks at the end, but don't use third-party inks, especially in fine art printers. Um, you know, there's all those ink refill places and you can buy those bulk inks on Amazon. When you're doing fine art G clay printing where color matters and you're using ICC profiles and following everything in this presentation, if you want the best results, don't use third party inks. Now use those on your, your office printer or your laser printer, whatever, if they're compatible, that's fine. But anything that's color critical, always use the genuine manufacturer inks because that's what the profiles are also designed to work with. Um, now I get asked this an awful lot. Can I use, I, or where can I find an ICC profile for my all-in-one printer? Um, well, there aren't any. Because those are four color CMYK printers, there's not too many paper companies that have developed ICC profiles for those printers. Um, there are ways that you can get them and we'll discuss that a bit later on, but generally you're not gonna find them. And press printers, uh, if it uses RIP software, you can generate your own ICC profiles um, and those aren't normally provided either. So these are more for your Epson P800, P900, P4000, uh, the big Canon roll printers as well. That type of fine art printer is what this presentation is talking about with ICC profiles. So how do you install a profile? Um, most of the instructions and videos you find out there on the web have to do with, with uh, Mac. I'm a Windows guy, so this will help all the Windows people, which tends to be about 80% of the customers out there. So we'll talk about uh, where to find them, how to download them, the instructions, and the important part of the instructions, something that you really want to read. So if you're in Canada, you're going to go to hanamula.ca. And on the extreme right of our webpage, it says ICC Profile. That will take you to Download Center. So we also have a, a specific section for installing profiles as well as an FAQ on the .ca site. It's a little different than the .com, but we tend to be pretty specific in our instructions. So now when you do click on the download, it does take you to the .com site, which is the international site. Why keep multiple copies of everything around? That site is maintained very well, has all of the latest and greatest profiles and information. So you start off, you pick your printer brand. You've got Canon, Epson, HP. From there, then you select your printer. So you've got a nice drop down, And then you pick your, your paper series. So this makes it a lot easier to find. Some other companies, they just have, oh, you've got a P800 and here's our five pages of printer profiles. Well, Hanamula has thought about conserving your time a little bit, so it's a little easier to find your profiles and you can just pick from the list and, and you get presented with a short list instead of scrolling and scrolling. So uh, very easy, you just click on the file and now it'll download as a zip file and that gets stored in your downloads folder on your computer. So easy to find, you can open it right from your browser, hit extract all. And once you've got all those files open, it you'll get a new window will open. It'll show you those four PDFs and then your ICC profile. In Windows, all you have to do is right click the profile and then select install profile. It's that simple. It's it never used to be, trust me. You used to have to copy these and then find some buried folder in a system folder. It was a pain in the rear end, but now um, it's as simple as right clicking and installing. and that and it's done. Uh, Mac is very, very similar instructions. Thankfully, in the four PDFs, you've got German, English, Spanish, and French. So in Canada, English and French are the official languages, so I'm glad we have those covered. Thank you, Anamula. Um, 
So open up the instructions file because there is something really, really important. So on these PDFs, you'll notice the very first heading and they, so I'm using a P800, it says Epson sure color photo black and then some of them will say matte black. So that lets you know in the instructions, and this is why you shouldn't delete these PDFs, you should keep them handy until you've committed it to memory. Um, but you can have, keep all of these because it'll tell you which ink to use. Now the profile will tell you as well. So if we back up, uh, so you'll notice in the file name, it's got HFA underscore EPS P800. So that tells us that it's a Hanamula fine art profile for the Epson P800. The PK means photo black. So if you can't remember, or you, if you pooch the PDF file, um, the ink is in the profile name as well. So that helps us remember which ink. But either way, um, it'll help you pick the correct ink. And I'm gonna explain a bit later on why the correct ink is so important when you're printing uh, or making fine art prints, which we're gonna get into now. So uh, some of the more specific stuff about paper types and ICC profiles, and this is answering questions that I get regularly. You know, which side of the paper do I print on? Uh, which black do I use, the photo black or the matte black? And then what happens if I use a different profile other than the proper one? So let me answer these for you. Generally, Hanamula papers, and Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you no, know, I've got lots of open boxes, but generally Hanamula papers are print side up in the box. That's correct. That's Thank correct. you. Yeah, so that's very easy to tell. Um, hopefully you put them back in the box the way that you pulled them out. So I can do because one of the nice things with Hanamula papers is there is a cardboard base at the bottom of the, the pile. So you can keep that at the bottom of the box. Um, even with matte papers, the inkjet coating side is shiny. So with gloss papers, it's really easy to tell, but even with PhotoRag 308, which is our most popular paper, um, it still has just a little bit of a sheen on that inkjet coated side. So if you hold the paper up to a light, you can still see that sheen um, on that coated side. Now, and Kevin, you'll have to do confirm with me, but some of the sample packs may or may not have the name on the back. Um, I'm not aware of any of them not having the names on the back, Will, so they should all be printed on the back, and if yeah. it's, that's, that's not the case, then that's, then that's new to me, even the 13 by 19 sample packs. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks. So sample packs are definitely uh, an easy way to tell which, which is right side up. Um, and then, of course, if you do happen to load your paper in the wrong way, it's going to smear badly. As soon as you handle it, the ink's going to smear because it, the ink didn't have the coating to soak into on the paper. So that's kind of a last gas uh, scenario. Now, the other thing on a lot of uncoated papers, which, and especially textured papers uh, that a lot of people don't know, is look at the bump. So if I pull out my William Turner, and I will ask any of you with textured paper to test this out on your own but if you hold this up the bumps will appear raised on the coated side whereas the uncoated side they appear depressed and that seems to always work for me in a pinch when I grab a box of paper from the office that might have been at a trade show because paper can be everywhere in that so that's an, uh, a little more difficult way but you can tell just by whether the bumps look raised or depressed into the paper. So which black do I use? So photo black will work on any paper. It's, it'll print fine on matte paper. However, if you're using matte black ink, the black is designed specifically for matte paper. So um, it'll give you richer, darker blacks. And it also, um, the matte black is designed, it won't dry on coated papers. So it's meant for uncoated matte papers only. Um, and again, just to remind everybody, photo black is always PK in Hanamula profiles and matte black is MK. Uh, the K is from the printing industry. So printing presses, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. Everybody uses K for black instead of B, which in RGB is blue. So if you want the you know, speak background on that. B is blue, K is black. 
So what happens if you use a different profile than the one that you're supposed to? So as I mentioned, if you use photo black on matte papers, your blacks are gonna be less contrasty and less rich. So they're gonna be a lot flatter. Um, matte black will definitely smudge on coated papers. Um, and you're gonna notice it because it runs pretty badly. Uh, even if you're using matte photo black on matte papers, not just your blacks, but if you use the wrong profile, say I use photo rag 308 on uh, photo rag metallic, the colors aren't gonna look right. And when I get into soft proofing, you'll see a bit more of that um, in detail. But because those papers receive ink differently, the profiles are set specifically for them. Plus the white point is very, very different between photo rag metallic and photo rag 308. So the inks, the application is completely different and the colors will be off. Not severely and a trained eye will pick it up. Sometimes you can get that past a customer, but really if they're paying for it, just do it right. Um, now part of, if you're in here learning about ICC profiles and calibration, then we wanna talk about process calibration as well. And that's doing everything right, right from the start. So you're gonna to wanna to use gray cards, or a color checker. So I've got my uh, data color color checker in here, which is almost due for replacement. Um, and or a gray card, I use these on, if I do a shoot that I'm making money, I'm using my gray cards. So I wanna make sure that my white balance, so my capture is the best possible capture that I can create. So I'm gonna, use this in Capture One as my preferred uh, editing suite because I can create a profile for every shoot based on my color check. Now my monitors are always calibrated. So I use the Data Color Spider. I don't have the new X yet because there's nothing wrong with my previous version Spider. And I've shown you my before and after. So I invested in good quality monitors that are supposed to be 100% sRGB and they are but the default calibrations on those monitors aren't accurate and I'll give you a quick story here because I think I have time. Um, when I had first started my photography business I did a big shoot it was 600 students in a school um, sold all the packages sent them off to the lab I thought that they were all edited properly and when I got all of the prints back, there was a very yellow, warm cast to them. And I called them up and they said, well, that's the way the file was. Are you using a calibrated monitor? And I said, well, I just bought these brand new, you know, sRGB monitors. And they said, well, if you don't calibrate them, you're not going to get the same results because what you see on the screen is not what we get. And I said, because I'm looking at my monitor and all those color tones are looking great. And they pulled it up on their system. They said, yeah, everything looks warm here. So I went out, bought a spider after about an hour of research, calibrated my monitors, redid the entire shoot. So it cost me a pile of money. This was, you know, as most lessons are, they are expensive, um, but I learned to calibrate. I sent all those, resent those files back. Um, they came back from the lab perfect this time. I delivered them to the clients. They were all you know, over the moon. Everything worked out perfectly. Um, and I learned to calibrate and recalibrate um, regularly so that I'm getting the best information coming in from my camera through my editing process. And because I use ICC profiles, I'm getting the best prints as well when I'm doing fine art prints. Now, I get asked this a lot. Why do the images on my monitor still not look exactly like what I see on paper? So quick geek speak explanation is you're looking at the differences between what you may hear as transmissive color versus reflective color or additional or additive versus subtractive color. So your monitor uses light and it's taking um, either from white or from black, but it's um, photons are creating that color. So generally it's called subtractive because you're starting with um, white and it's removing levels of light to create the colors that you see on your monitor. You could consider it adding, but we tend to call that more um, subtractive. It's also transmissive because the light is coming through the monitor at you, whereas paper is reflective. The, 
light is bouncing off the paper and showing you that color. Um, and also paper is additive because the ink gets added on. It's not like your printer has 64 million colors of ink inside. Even my P800 has um, 10 ink. So all those colors are built by adding colors together and combining them. So that's called additive um, or reflective because the light is reflecting. So you have to understand there's no way to get 100% perfect, but having a calibrated workflow right from capture through to print is going to give you the best possible outcomes. So let's talk about some of our print settings and soft proofing and why we would want a soft proof. Now I'll talk about the most popular software because Photoshop, Lightroom and Capture One are about 99% of the market. Yes, I know that there are a lot of other programs out there, Affinity and Apple has some, but really professionals, anybody making money off their work is using one of those three. Uh, so one of the reasons for soft proofing is you can actually see a representation, it's fairly close of how your paper will look when you're printing it. So the easiest way to soft proof I find in Photoshop is in the print dialog. So I open my print dialog, I select my printer, I go into color management, and the very first thing I do is go to color handling and say Photoshop manages colors. And then I go to printer profile and I select my profile. So in this case, I've got my photo rag metallic up there. And if you look at this closely, you can see that there is a bit of a gray sheen to the paper. Now this, I did screen grabs to save data and time because we all know how technology works when we're relying on it. So I can't flip back and forth on this screen. You'll see it a bit later on. But if you um, enable match print colors on the bottom and show paper white, Photoshop will give you a representation on screen of how that paper color will transmit to your image. And then your gamut warning will also show you if you have too much ink, how that's going to affect your print. So I found that some papers with some images, so if I switch this over to uh, Photo Rag 308, it actually blows out the highlights a little bit on the white fur around the deer's nose. So in that case, I go back into the image and I can tweak the image a little bit to make sure that I don't lose any of that data if that's what I'm after. But otherwise, this does give me a very good representation of how my image is gonna look when I print it. Um, now we'll talk about, there's some of these settings get pretty advanced. You'll notice under rendering intent, relative colorimetric and black point compensation. I'll talk about that a little bit further down the line. Um, and those are important to a point, but uh, but seeing as this is more for beginners and entry level, we're not going to get too heavy into this. Now, you can also soft proof your images right in Photoshop while you're viewing them as well, if you want to. But this involves changing your working color space while you're working on the image and viewing proofs in Photoshop. And you've got to be really careful uh, that you're not creating an image or overwriting an image that you might need for something else. Because... If you're presenting for the web, you want sRGB as your uh, color space, but if you're printing and if you're printing on different papers, you don't want to lock yourself in with uh, assigning a print profile specifically to proofing, but you can soft proof right in Photoshop by using the view menu. So we're going to, what's nice here is you can customize your proof condition, I call it. So I set this one up specifically for photo rag metallic because I print with this one a lot and I've saved it. So after you've created your whole um, dialogue and set this up, you can actually under the, on the right hand side, you've got okay, cancel, load and save. You can save your profile once you've created it, which makes it a lot easier to find from the drop down menu. Um, preserve RGB numbers is something that I found doesn't work very well with printing because it introduces a lot of color shifts, especially when you use a dynamic paper like photo rag metallic. So I tend to leave that uh, deselected. Now, a lot of the instructions for using these papers, hey, guess where they are? In the PDF that you downloaded with your ICC profile. So those instructions will tell you whether to use relative colorimetric, colorimetric rendering, as well as if you should enable black point compensation. So black point compensation will actually adjust 
the black ink, the shadows, and the highlights of your image. So it compresses the dynamic range a bit to fit the paper that you're printing. So it reduces the chance of blown out highlights or washed out shadows because it's creating those, a little more uh, gradation in those tones in your image. So black point compensation I found to be very, very important unless I'm printing silhouettes or very contrasty images. And of course, you do want to have preview turned on because you want to see the effects on screen when you're doing it. Um, and as I mentioned in the print dialog, you want that simulate paper color enabled so that you can see um, that paper white and how it's going to affect your image. Now, especially with metallic, if you're always using matte papers or uh, gloss or semi-gloss, it's not that big of a difference. But if you start using pearls and metallics, you definitely want to see that paper color simulated on screen. So here's a comparison showing um, a couple of different profiles. Sorry, I have to get closer because I can't read them. So this is the difference between absolute cover and metallic. Sorry, I could have labeled that a little better on my PowerPoint. <laughs> Technical glitch. Oh, well. um, so you'll notice that the image with relative color metric is a little bit darker. And that's because it's compressed those highlights. If you look at the snout of the deer, uh, there's a lot of blown out highlights and in the, the ears or what could be missing highlights. So absolute keeps the colors how you've edited them in uh, Photoshop, whereas relative compresses that image, it changes it a little bit. So you have a wider range of tones and you don't have any blown out highlights or shadows. So you can switch very easily. You can use keyboard shortcuts or use the view menu and you can switch that soft proofing on and off as you're working on an image. So if you're doing something specific, uh, say you've got a layer that you're using to edit just for that image of dodge and burn layer, uh, now you can soft proof back and forth just by flipping around so you can see the effects before and after. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but Lightroom does allow you to soft proof as well. Uh, it's in, of course, the most odd spot. It's in the develop module. You would think it would be in the library module where you're able to, to look at things or even in the print module, but specifically soft proofing is available in uh, the develop module. So you go up to view, go down to soft proofing and show proof, or you can hit S on your keyboard and that'll bring it up. So now you've got a new um, window right below your histogram and you can now choose your profile. Well, just go through this, the drop down list and choose your profile. Now I've got another reason I didn't do this live is I've got all of the Hanamiola profiles as well as some others in my computer. So it takes forever to find them. So um, screen grabs are definitely a little quick. So the other place that you can soft proof is when you get into the print module. And you also want to use these settings when you're printing in Lightroom. Um, go down to print job, which is on the lower right. It's one of the last modules down there. Make sure that your print resolution is set to at least 300. Again, look at the PDF because it tells you those instructions. Some papers actually print better at 240. Some of them will print better at higher resolutions. So read the PDF, set the print resolution to match. Print re sharpening, I tend to keep low. It's a personal preference. I hate auto because auto can do some weird things to your images. If you've sharpened it in the sharpening module in develop, you don't want to introduce any more sharpening in the print module. Uh, so my personal preference is low. You can play around with this on your own. Um, and then you're going to pick your media type based on the type of paper, which again, go back to that PDF, it'll tell you. So if you're using a photo black or if you're using a matte black, you'll change your media type to match that. And you also notice that under color management, it, the default is managed by printer. We wanna get rid of that, select the proper profile, which in this case for today is the Hanamiola Photo Rag Metallic. Uh, now Capture One will also do soft proofing. Um, so again, it's in the uh, view menu, but you can also create your own recipe so anybody who uses Capture One extensively um, knows to use 
profile recipes. I've got a whole pile of recipes built into my system. So I've created one specifically for printing. And then now I can just select it from the drop down list. So you can, once you've got proofing enabled, there's a couple of different ways. So there's the slow way, which means going to the view menu and you've got enable and disable proof preview. I'm not a mouse person as much as I can. I like to use the keyboard or I like to keep things out of menus. So I'll give you a little tip for Capture One. You can customize your toolbar across the top. So if you notice this image right above the deer, uh, there's some, they look like glasses or binoculars up there and it says proofing underneath. So this is really easy to set up. You right click, on your toolbar and you click customize and then you just drag that proofing icon to your toolbar. And now you just click on the glasses and you'll notice above the deer, it says proofing. So that's giving me my photo rag metallic proof preview right in capture one. I don't have to flip modules or mess around with uh, opening the print dialog. I can do that right in the main window of uh, capture one. So. If you happen to be working on your develop settings and uh, you're applying corrections in there, now you can see in your proof exactly how your, um, your applications are working. And from the little drop down arrow in beside the binoculars, you can pick your process recipes and you can proof that image in any process recipe that you've got without changing the recipe. So that's even better because uh, say I've, I've been shooting studio high key portraits and I've got my recipe for that, but I want a proof because I'm printing it on photo rag metallic or on William Turner, I can pick that out of my drop down list. So I can proof it in a different recipe that I'm editing in and it doesn't destroy the information I've saved in Capture One. So I'm not creating more work for myself. It's actually far more efficient. So it's just another one of those things I love about uh, Capture One. So you can also, if you want to, uh, when you're printing, you can apply your profiles there as well, which I recommend that you do. And when I show you the print settings dialog, that's uh, similar in Mac, but Windows specific as well. A couple of key things to turn off uh, because these come back to questions I get an awful lot as well. So I have a process recipe there called Photo Rag Metallic that's saved in there. So it's just like creating a, another recipe for saving um, all of your edit settings, but in this case, it's just the ICC profile. So it's not changing exposure settings or lens corrections or any of the advanced features. It's just a recipe for the ICC profile and just to save it for proofing. So you create it the way you normally would, but you're only working in that one dialog box. So again, when you get into printing from Capture One, um, you want to make sure that your color profile is set right in the printing dialog box. And then the next box, I'll show you where you're gonna change that in your printer set. So you're gonna, after you've set everything up the way you want to print in Capture One, or if you've been using Lightroom or um, Photoshop, you've got all that set, then you're gonna to wanna to hit the print setting. So this is how it looks in Windows. So I get, get this question asked really a lot of times. No, I've done everything right with my ICC profiles in, in Windows or Lightroom or C1, but then when I print, nothing looks the way it's supposed to look. So the biggest key in this entire thing is you're gonna notice under about the middle of the box, you've got media settings are in the middle and right at the bottom, it says mode. You've got to set this to off, no color management. So what you're doing here is you're telling your printer not to apply any color management. If you leave that with one of the defaults or pick some other setting, it winds up, um, I'm not sure if it overrides it or it duplicates it, but it certainly makes a messier image because you're applying another profile. You're applying the printer profile on top of the ICC profile and it confuses the printer and it doesn't know how to create the right print job for you because it's got too many profiles going on. So you always disable the profile on your printer. Now, there is a caveat to this. If you have some of the higher end 
uh, printers that allow you to install profiles direct to the printer, then of course you're going to pick that profile here. You don't have to worry about it in um, in your software. You're going to do that in the print dialog box, or either or. Turn it off in the printer, enable it in uh, in your software, but use one or the other. But make sure one of them is always disabled. And for the average um, home printer, you're going to want to turn it off in the print settings dialog box. So everything else, so media type, you're going to go back to your PDF, you want to read that PDF, or if your profile tells you MK or PK, but the PDF will tell you which paper profile to use. And that's why they're printer specific, because it'll tell me which, pa which Epson paper, not that I use Epson paper on my printer anymore, but it'll tell me which Epson paper to pick, because that's based on thickness and it tells the printer some other stuff that it needs. But thankfully, the Hanamula ICC profile tells it how to apply the ink properly. So that'll all work the way it should. So those are your two important things. Read the PDF to get your media type set correctly. And, but first set the mode to off, no color management. So that that's, then you can go in and set sizes and whatever else based on your print job, because that's specific to how you're printing. And hopefully you know what you're printing at that point. All right. So a two, few tips and tricks. So what if a profile doesn't exist for my printer? Um, first thing to do is if you're in Canada, you can email me. Um, Kevin can throw my email in the chat. It's just will at amplis.com. Uh, you can also contact Hanamula direct and ask them if there's a profile. Now with new printers, they tend to be pretty good at creating new profiles and they're working on those. Usually the people asking about profiles are for four color office printers and they, those just don't exist. Now, if you have an older printer that's still working, there is a profile archive on the hanamula.com uh, download page. So you can download, there are still profiles available. No point in deleting them if they're already created, but we just don't have them listed with all of the current printers. So we may just have to direct you to the right page to download your profile. Uh, so when you're editing, you want to do your edits and your capture in Adobe RGB or ProPhoto RGB, even black and white images, except Capture One. I find Capture One, if I'm editing black and white images in a monochrome profile, is far more accurate. But um, when you're working in Lightroom and Photoshop, it's preferable that you're doing your work with the most color data possible. So Mission critical stuff where color is absolutely vital. I tend to edit my images in ProPhoto RGB because that's the widest gamut uh, profile out there, especially if I'm getting images from a phase one, uh, you know, ProPhoto by default anyways. Um, otherwise it's Adobe RGB. I wanna maximize the data that I'm working with so that I can create the best possible print later. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ICC profiles don't work with most RIP software. There are some exceptions and you can reach out to us to find out what those are. A lot of times uh, the RIP software, you can create your own profile based on your inks and papers, uh, but we do have some available. Now printing, this is another one I get asked a lot because especially people in the business world, I think anybody who's a designer nowadays deals with this regularly. How come my PNG file doesn't print properly? Yeah, we don't print PNGs because those are display files meant for looking at, not for printing. So if you're going to print JPEG maximum quality, um, I never use anything less than 12 or maximum in uh, photo in any of my editing software. I never downsize a JPEG except for if it's going specifically to, to the web. Uh, if it's a Facebook, Instagram website image, then I'll downgrade it to six or eight quality, but otherwise every JPEG is a 10 or a 12, um, or I'm using EPSs for vector artwork. Um, uncompressed PDF is, um, I'm still not sold on that. Sometimes it works, but it all depends on the source image. So if I'm exporting uh, PDFs from InDesign of ads and things like that, then those proofs I will print from an uncompressed PDF. Um, I don't like printing from compressed PDFs because it does mess with image quality. Um, and then anything larger, when I'm doing poster prints, there are always TIFF files. 
I find I get better gradations and color tones with TIFF than JPEG. So anything larger than say a 16 by 20, I'm automatically saving that as a TIFF from the raw file and then I'm printing from the TIFF. Um, I don't print from raw files, even in Capture One, I'll save it as a TIFF and print from there or I'll save it as a JPEG and print from there. I find that's giving me better print quality and also faster prints. Um, raw files, especially with larger uh, high megapixel cameras tend to take a long time to process for printing. So um, yeah, 150 megapixel phase one raw file does not process that well when you're trying to print it, but uh, that TIFF file tends to go through really quickly. They're just, the TIFF is an optimized format for working with that kind of uh, system. Um, and always work with high res files. So if you're printing eight by tens, you can get away with 150 DPI. If you're printing 11 by 14, 16 by 20 and larger, you're gonna wanna go at least 300 DPI until you get to the really, you know, sign poster size. I used to work in a, um, a sign shop where we were printing artwork on the sides of transports. If you wanna know why that McDonald's Big Mac looks so good on the transport, rolling beside you it's because that's actually printed at around 120 to 140 dpi it's it's a pretty high resolution image it's not uh printed at lower res so that's one of the reasons that particular one looks really good or well used to anyways i don't print them anymore so but uh especially with your fine art prints if you want a good quality print remember gigo garbage in garbage out so don't feed your printer garbage if you don't want it to spit out garbage. Give it the best possible files. So JPEGs or TIFFs, high resolution. Um, but I'm also asked, so why don't I just throw a 900 DPI file at my printer? Now my printer says it'll do 1440 by 2880 DPI. Well, your printer can't technically handle that much input and it's the software in the printer doing that conversion and it's the size of the ink drops from the printer that are able to create that resolution but feeding a 900 dpi file isn't really going to give you much better output but it really is going to slow down your print job so um, 300 dpi tends to be around uh, the best but if you're not printing the image if you're sending it to a print shop like smokestack Ask them what the recommended resolution is when you're proofing your image and when you're saving it. So you're not sending them this 55 gigabyte 900 DPI 8 by 10 file. You're sending them, you know, a three megabyte JPEG that's 300 DPI or 260, depending on the printer. So uh, work with your printer as well if you're not sure and, and optimize your file for print. So um, that was quick. It was. Uh, Hopefully yeah. you found that informative and uh, I have to, I have to check, have to check my pulse. Will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure on pacing. So I just, uh, I, I kept that one. It's, it's well. great. We do have some questions. Um, um, all the videos that have happened the last three days will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I posted it on the site. So give it till next week sometime. I mean, um, it takes a while to compile all the information and, and such like that. Uh, email addresses. I did post uh, Will's email address. I did also post the, the photonews.ca. Uh, this is an excellent publication for all of us photo weenies out there. It is full of great reading. Will writes uh, with some frequency, I should say. And as you found, Will is incredibly in, insightful. Uh, and, and he boils things down, as I said at the beginning, for us muggles. Um, and, and I like the fact that he's a Windows guy on top of that. Uh, you can also, and as Travis is commenting, uh, uh, Travis Magani with us, you can also log back into this event uh, at any time and watch them again. Uh, I, this event should be uploaded onto the platform tomorrow, so you can log back in until they get uploaded on YouTube. So yeah, uh, that, that may be... That may be the easier way to do that, especially if we go through things like this. Um, but but questions. Um, will the videos be closed captioned? Uh, a great question, Kate. I don't know the answer to that, uh, but you make up a good point. I'll have to take it take that behind the curtains. Um, also, a question: Will Pro Photo RGB might not show all the colors on the print? Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you have any comments on yeah. that. Um, let me just respond to Kate's question about the closed captioning. So. Yep. Um, I'd like to get this on, we have our Photo News TV channel on YouTube. 
YouTube generates auto captions. So hopefully that'll work for you. Um, I find that they tend to be pretty good. Oh, okay. uh, so hopefully that's an option, Kate. Um, if not, then you know, grab my email address from the chat and I'll see what I can do to caption it afterwards. Or I can start with the YouTube captions and, and correct them. That's easy enough uh, to do after the fact. Um, that's that's fantastic. I learned something new uh, every day I get up. Uh, is this yeah, really a little gear icon on uh, YouTube on the bottom? There's a gear and you nice. can select closed captions and you can even change the language. Amazing world I live in. I'm, I'm so glad I'm hanging with you this afternoon, Will. <laughs> so, um, I, I feel like you touched on this, but I just want to make sure we got the question answered for, uh, for Michelle. Is this relevant if we calibrate, calibrate our chain of production, if we calibration from display to printer? I, I think you touched on that, but just want to make sure yeah. that that got addressed for the question. Yeah, yeah. Michelle's got two great questions. So Profoto RGB, you are correct. It doesn't show all of the colors that your printer is capable of reproducing. Profoto RGB shows more colors uh, than any printer is capable of reproducing. It's generally for ultra high resolution, ultra color critical work that I use Profoto RGB. Um, there's also very few monitors that will give you proper Profoto RGB uh, reproduction on screen. So uh, that's where gamut warnings and so there's some specialized workflow things that you need to work on if you're working with Profoto RGB. Um, but I do find that if I have to print something with a lot of color gradations or specific colors, I have one client that I work for. Um, they have their own Pantone ink that's used on the machinery that they manufacture. So all of the images that I capture and then convert to uh, JPEGs for them and that they print their brochures from that color has to be exact. So Profoto RGB helps me ensure that that's exact before I convert it to um, sRGB for printing. But yeah, printers can't print Profoto RGB. And when you're printing, you're going to use the ICC profile for your paper. So Profoto RGB is irrelevant when it comes to print. Okay. Uh, I heard over and over and over again, read the PDF, read the PDF, read the PDF. Read yep, the exactly. PDF. Read the PDF. That's it. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and I hear this quite often, people don't set the right print media settings and it's in the PDF. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. We've spoke about this many said. times and generally that's gonna solve the problems uh, more and more. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I'm Michelle's that. other question about calibrating from display to printer. Um, as I said, when it came to printing, GIGO, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and as I learned with that print, my uh, example of sending that print job before I had calibrated my monitor. Um, you know, I sent a $2,000 print job out that I had to spend another two grand reprinting. So all my profits got eaten up because I didn't start with a calibrated workflow. So uh, now when I use my uh, data color spider checker, I start every shoot with this. So I'm calibrating my lights. Uh, so I shoot with brawn color, which are already pretty darn good to begin with, but I still calibrate my lights before every shoot because you never know what uh, ambient light's gonna affect your shoot. So I start with calibrated input from the camera. So it's profiled to my camera, depending which one I'm using. Um, and then it's a calibrated workflow on my computer. So what I'm looking at on my monitors is calibrated. And then my print output uh, coming out of the printers is all calibrated. So. Um, you know, nothing's 100%, but I've removed 99.9999% of the obstacles in creating a good print. Sure. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so about out of time, but a, a personal question. Will, you mentioned a couple of papers. Uh, what, what are some of your papers that you like to print on? Oh, yeah. My two favorites, as I mentioned, was the photo rag metallic, because that's right here. Um, and then my William Turner, which I always have a box beside me. Um, and then the new... Well, the natural line. So I've got the agave with me, which is another one of my favorites. And I want to get my hands on the sugar cane because I love Turner so much that... Uh, yep. So sugar cane is not quite on the water yet. I think it's soon, but, but we're yep. getting closer. We'll get some samples uh, to you guys, certainly. And and uh, so, and the sugar cane will fit into the natural line. So uh, uh, Kate, Kate Jordan is howling about Turner and bamboo. Uh, so anyway... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, those those are great great papers. We were talk, talking to Smokestack uh, earlier today, and 
and Jonathan is all over bamboo. I mean, uh, all over bamboo. And the natural line has done very well in the market. Uh, so the sugar cane will fit into it. I, I can't, I always learn something when I hang around this guy. Uh, it, it's been great. I, I appreciate all your time and effort that you put into this, Will. Thank you again and again, the entire Photo News and Ampla staff. Thanks, Haley, uh, Jerry, who takes care of things, and Will, who's always in the background and always, uh, always does such a great job. Uh, thank you all for attending. This is our last presentation, yeah, official presentation. We have a, we have a Q and A session next. Please join us. The Hanamule staff will be there to answer any questions and talk about the marketplace or whatever we want to talk about. Thank you all. Thank you, Will. Great to yeah, see thanks, you, Kevin. I will be up to Canada very, very soon. You bet. Coffee's on you. Uh, yeah, it will be. Plan on it. It's great to see you again, Will. <laughs> thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye.